And my thesis is that the ancient Chinese once worshipped a personal and relational God who rules lovingly and justly through his region. They also believe and practice vicarious sacrifice to maintain their relationship to this personal God. I, I shared about the character of God as recorded by Chinese in their ancient classics the last time. I also shared about the most original indigenous and continuous uh, religious practice that is the annual border sacrifice. Now notice that that sacrifice, just as in the Hebrew sacrifice, are not meant to save people. They are meant to direct people to the ultimate sac sacrifice that is in Jesus Christ. And that is amply explained in the book of Hebrews <coughs> that even the, the, the Leviticus uh, practice uh, cannot save men. So we are not saying that the ancient Chinese were saved through those sacrifices, but they were revealed to them by God so that when Jesus arrives, people will know that he is that sacrifice they're looking forward to. Okay, today we're moving on to, hopefully we have time for three other uh, support for my argument. And those are ideologies embedded in Chinese character. Okay, and then uh, I want to look at the records and interpretations of extra events in Chinese history. Um, ancient Chinese, like uh, the Babylonians and even the Persians, were astute observers of the skies. And they, they record them and they interpreted them. And I will share that with you uh, afterwards. And then Magi, these are the wise men from the West. I call them the experts' opinion. Just as in the case, in the court case, we can, uh, we can bring experts to testify. So I am inviting these uh, very wise men to testify their opinion. Okay, we, we talked about the name above all name, Shangdi and Tian, and how they correspond with the character of God that you can study in any systematic theology in a seminary. And then we talked about the border sacrifice and remember why it is called a border sacrifice because it has to be done outside, outside the city and to the east. And that's again, very, even in that is very consistent with the Hebrew practice. So today we want to go into words have meaning. Now the Chinese language, as you are all aware, is unique in the world. It's called fan kuai zi, okay, the, the square character. It is still iconic, uh, unlike all the other languages. Now, initially, all the written records of the world were iconic. Like if you go to Egypt, you see the hieroglyphs. Uh, it took the Rosetta Stone to reveal uh, the meaning, but they are iconic, meaning, you know, like the icons you have on your cell phone, the apps. There are no words, but when you look at the symbol, you know what it means. But the problem with that is that, and I'm sure uh, those of you who struggle through learning Chinese is that you have to memorize every word. And a college student, Chinese college student, university student, normally has to master about 5,000 words. So that's a challenge. So. Written words even. All right, um, so written uh, language evolved into phonetic system, you know, the alphabets that we have, because it is easier for people to, to learn the language. And there are there is a new discovery, by the way, if you're interested, uh, if you can Google patterns of evidence. Um, typically, the experts think that the Phoenicians were the inventor of the alphabets. Then you went from, you know, Phoenicia to the West, and you know we have the Greek for, uh, alphabet and then the Latin alphabet and all that. But now there is a new discovery, and I actually believe them that it is the Hebrews that had first come out with the alphabet. And guess who? It was probably Joseph who designed them. But that's another story. Okay, the Chinese kept the iconic system. And 
we have very good records because unlike the Egyptians uh, who wrote on papyrus and or later, you know, uh, ship skin, the Chinese had their written language and engraved in uh, oracle bones such as this or in bronze objects. And because they are iconic, you find that they do evolve, but not entirely different. Now, with the phonetic system, the alphabet system, when pronunciation change, they have to change the writing, right? They have to match the spoken word. So if you look at the early edition of the King James Bible, you are all familiar with that. If you look at, just Google it and look at an, uh, a King James Bible from maybe even 200 years ago, I will tell you, you cannot recognize them, all right? They are supposed to be English words, but they're very different uh, in appearance because they are pronounced differently. But with the Chinese iconic system, you will see that even though it has evolved, it is more a stylistic change and you can still trace them quite easily. Now, with the iconic system, basically, and I'm just generalizing, three main categories. You have the concrete, meaning that the word looks like the real object. Like this is the word yang for sheep, and this is the word for mountain, sun, you can see, like the mountain range. And then you see this is a person. It's a person walking, okay? His uh, legs are apart. And then the second category are idiomatic. Now, because not every word has a concrete picture, so uh, a lot of the words are idiomatic. You put concepts together and then you form a word. So like this is a word for rest, siu. You have here the radical. Uh, this is the other thing about the iconic language. You use a the word radical in Chinese is pu so. It, uh, it's, it's a category of word. So when you look at it, now I, you may not be able to pronounce it, but you can see uh, this is a man, all right? It's this man that is now uh, turned into a radical, so he stood up. And then you have a tree here. So the picture is a man leaning on the tree. So he is resting. And this is a word I'm sure most of you know how, you know, yu zi. Some people say, ah, you know, women are good. No, actually, uh, the idea is when you have a boy and a girl, wow, that's, uh, you know, it's good. It's, it's completion, all right? And then this is the word for Tian heaven. Last time I talked about it. It's from the word ta, and it is one bigger than ta, one bigger than the greatest. So it is the supreme one, that is God. Okay, the third kind of words are the vocal, the one that will give you the sound. So like, this is the original word for meow. And then you add a radical for a animal, it becomes mao, all right? That's the sound of a cat. So basically these three uh, categories, and I will focus more on the first two, especially the second one. Now, when it comes to idiomatic symbols, uh, such as this one. Now you all know what this means, right? It is danger. It doesn't mean that there, you know, there are scar there. It simply means that if you get near that, you will touch it, you will eat it, you will become like that. All right. Um, we use symbols uh, around us today on the highway, in buildings. We don't use words. We use symbols because symbols gives us the meaning right away. People do not need to know how to pronounce it. They just need to see it. You know, even a kid looking at this and know, oh, oh, oh dear, you know, don't get near that. Uh, that is the idea of idiomatic symbols. And this is the other thing that is even more powerful. It's the continuity of idiomatic symbols, the embedded meaning in it. These are the international symbols for toilets, right? It's very important that we all know. This was invented by the Japanese in 1964 when they received the war to Tokyo for the Olympics. Now, you know that the Japanese is a monolingual culture and they know that um, unless they use some symbols, the, their guests from all over the world 
will not know where to go, especially this is the most important place for a person uh, traveling every day, right? Uh, we, every time we have a stop, you know, that's the first place we go to. So it's the most important place that people need to go to. And they, the Japanese are very smart. They realize, you know, if they list all the written languages for the rest of the world, there's no space on the door. So they came up with these two symbols, all right? Now it is the international standard, pretty much. There's some places that use funny symbols and then you get confused, uh, which is which. But this is very clear. All right, look at here. This symbol for the ladies' room has a woman wearing skirt. Let's assume that 4,000 years later, no more skirt, all right? No more dress. Men and women dress all the same. Just assume that. But this symbol will not change with fashion. Fashion can change, but this symbol has already got a place in the world right? and it doesn't need to change because you don't need to pronounce it. You just need to look at it and people will understand that this means the ladies' room. 4,000 years later, no more dresses. But our descendants can look at this symbol and say, aha, uh -huh. you know, in ancient times, the women wear something like that. You see the point? that by studying these iconic symbols, we can actually tell what our ancient forefathers knew and what they think about certain subjects. That's the important thing. And I want to reveal to you some of these. This is the most popular Chinese word, right? Especially during Chinese New Year, you see people hanging it all over the places. Some go upside down. This is the Chinese word for blessing. This is the most important word for the Chinese people. We all want a blessing. When I share uh, Christ, you know, the four spiritual law is uh, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Uh, that is a Western concept. But with the Chinese, I share God loves you and has a blessing for you. And that makes a lot of sense. Okay, this is a word that the Chinese loves and yet many times it is misinterpreted. Now, people will think, oh, you know, uh, blessing means having, you know, uh, something to dress, yifu, and uh, yikou tian, you know, something to eat and, and a piece of land. Uh, but that is a wrong interpretation. First of all, that radical, the puso, is not yifu, it's reveal, si. Because God is a self-revealing -re one. The ancient Chinese used this symbol to represent God. Um, every word, every word that has this puso, si, which means God, it's a spiritual word. So the very first thing that we need to understand is that blessing here, it is a spiritual word, not a material word. You see, E is written like this. I mean, just like in the Hebrew language, one dot makes a difference. You see on the top left, it is the si, puso. But the bottom shows you the one e. This is why some people mistaken blessing to mean having something to, to dress. You know, it is wrong. Uh, because God only, we can only know God when God reveals himself. The ancient Chinese knew that and they use that for the symbol of God. And then this uh, part on the top right, um, people mistake that for yi kou tian, but it is actually a concrete symbol. It is a symbol of a jar and a jar of wine, particularly. Now, the part that has been simplified, and that happens in the Chinese uh, words, because sometimes, you know, like we all know the, uh, the simplified version of uh, Chinese language uh, to make it easier for people uh, through time. Sometimes the, the parts are reduced. So the part that has been removed are this element on the bottom. Anybody can tell me what that is? It's a pair of hands that is raised up. All right. And the jar uh, actually refers to a covenantal relationship. It's just like when Jesus raised the cup and said, this is this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. So it, it is a picture of a covenantal relationship with God. So what is blessing? When you put all this together, this idiom is a very powerful and very clear picture of the ancient Chinese understanding 
of what blessing is. It is having a relationship with God. That is blessing. Blessed is a man, right, who walks with God, all right, who and all the beatitude. So you will see that the ancient Chinese understood the true meaning of blessing. And here I have the scripture for lifting up our hands. We lift up our hands to praise God. And, and those of us <coughs> who know him and praise him know that our most blessed experience is when we are worshiping God. Nothing beats that. All right. And this is the Chinese word to forbid. Tin, tin zi de tin. All right. You have two trees. And then remember this symbol on the bottom? Si, right? To review. So it is God and two trees. So when the ancient Chinese thought of a word to uh, depict, forbid, they remember the first thing, the first restriction uh, placed on man because God wanted man to exercise his will. So he put two trees there and the Chinese remember that. And then this is a related word to restrain. Uh, very interestingly, <coughs> you have mu and then ko. So when the Chinese thought about a word for restraint, the very first word they remember was the first restraint based on men, do not eat from that tree. But there was a third person, a new third person, not a man or a woman, not God, that was in the garden. And we all know that is Satan, the snake. Now, <clears throat> this is the Chinese word for the third person. Um, but interestingly, it is also in ancient times, the same word for snake. So you tell me, is that a coincidence? I tell you not. I think the ancient Chinese remembered the creation story, knew the Genesis story. Now remember at the dispersion that happened, that was described in Genesis 11, uh, the languages were mixed up, confused. God did not give them amnesia. I believe the group that went to China remembered and they, when they designed the words. Now, this is a thing about symbols, correct? That you need symbols that people know easily so that, you know, it can become in use. Uh, of course, there is a process of elimination. It's just like the apps you see on your, uh, your cell phone. You know, they, they evolve and then after a while, certain ones are so popular, they stick. So they remembered that there was a third person they eat in the garden and it was also the snake. So now <clears throat> a radical is added to it, the tong, all right, the, the reptile or the insect uh, radical is added to separate the two. But originally, if you look at ancient languages, sir and ta is the same word. Now, this is a Chinese word for to covet. To covet means to desire or want to have what you should not have. And notice here, there are two trees, but now in the state of God is a woman. And that becomes tan lan, the lan, okay, covet. So you, are, you, you tell me, you know, is, again, is it a coincidence? Because we all know that the woman was the one who fell. Now, by the way, don't blame the woman because if you, if you look at the scripture, you notice that her husband was with her when she was tempted. And this is all the more uh, that the problem of the man because he allowed somebody to tease his wife to tempt her and he said nothing. So somebody wrote a book called The Silence of Adam. So anyway, but it was nonetheless a woman that gave way and we have sin into the world. This is the Chinese word for sin. You see here on the bottom, it is like, you know, going in opposite direction. All right. It's like a pair of wings going in opposite direction. That means to contradict. And then the result is on top here. It is a snare. It's a net. So what is sin is a sin is you contradict the standard. And what is that standard? We all know it's God. So when Adam and Eve contradicted God's command, they fell into a snare. Now, this is another Chinese word. It is no longer in use, but you can still see in Chinese dictionary. This is another form of the word sin, 
uh, Qin Shi Huang, the first, well, the emperor who uh, conquered the other six nations and built the Great Wall, he changed his word. He, he decided he doesn't like it because it looks too much like his name, Huang. So it is no longer in use. But if you look at it, uh, Chinese dictionary, you will see that. If you like, you can see here, I can choose a word and type it. But this is uh, even closer in meaning to the biblical understanding of sin. The top part is zi, it's your nose, all right? It means you, zi, zi wo de zi. And then the bottom, you see here, this is sinku, pain, bitterness. So when the person is self-centered, sin is self-centeredness, the result is pain. Very interesting, isn't it? And I have a scripture here, but I won't take the time. Now, Satan tempted men and women, and the result is they fell into sin, and the result is death. This is a Chinese word for death. Here you have the tree. And then you have two mouths here, right? Two mouths represents two people. So it goes back to the Garden of Eden. This is how death enters the world when the man and woman fell and ate from that tree. Now, this is a very interesting word. Now, it, now this is a word that has the E, you know, clothing as a puzo, right? Notice that this is an extra dot here. And this word has to do with clothing. And on the right side is fruit. So you tell me, what is the relationship between nakedness and fruit? There's no other logical explanation except that we know that in the Garden of Eden, when they, when they ate from the fruit, they realized that they were naked, right? So there is, you know, coincidence. We all know that the best explanation is usually the, the simplest one. Uh, so here you can see that the ancient Chinese did know something about the creation story and they chose this word that they were familiar with, um, that the fruit resulted in people, um, you know, knowing that they are naked. Now, what was Satan's purpose in tempting an, an Adam and Eve? Really, God wanted to live in the hearts of man and woman. He wants to be in communion with us, but Satan wants to usurp that. And so he tempted them and the result is guilt. Now, the Chinese word for guilt is sin li yu kui, you know, having the devil in your heart. This is the radical for heart, and this is the word for the devil. So guilt is not a feeling. Guilt is a condition. Guilt is that when we sin, we let the devil into our heart. And sin also resulted in something very bad. This is the Chinese word for older brother, xiong, right, xiong zhang, the xiong. And the older brother is a spokesman of the family. So you can see the mouth. And then this is a word for son. So he's the son who speaks for the family. And this word is pronounced the same nowadays. It's shong. And you will see here, the ancient form is actually very graphic. And it's, again, there's no other explanation that is better than the one in the Bible. It is Cain who was jealous of his younger brother, he murdered him. So you can see this is a word for murder. And it is the older brother hitting the younger brother. And then there is a mark on his head. Well, voila! You know, this is exactly what the Bible tells us, that when Cain murdered his youngest brother, Abel, and God forgave him and put a mark on his forehead. Now you tell me, is this coincidence? I don't think so, because again, you know, this is the best explanation for why the Chinese chose to design this word uh, shown in this way. And then in order to bring man back into fellowship with himself, you know, God provided a sacrifice. We all know that the first sacrifice was performed when he killed the lambs so that Adam and Eve could have something to wear. And this is a Chinese word for uh, sacrifice. And you see here, God here. And now you notice here, this is an evolution. The very left is the most ancient form, what they call the Jia Gu Wen, the oracle bone. And these are the bronze inscription. You see that originally they just have a hand with a piece of meat with blood, you know. So 
because the result of sin is death. And so to cure that, somebody has to sacrifice, you know, uh, death has to happen. So here you can see, um, this is a sacrifice performed by God. Okay, this is a Chinese word for vessel, qi min the min. But when you add a stroke on top, it becomes blood. So why is that? So covenants were very important in ancient China. And in a covenant, blood is always shared. And the covenanting parties will always mix the blood in this cup or chalice um, to signify this. First of all, we know from the scripture that blood, life is in the blood. Interestingly, right? That a few thousand years ago, the, the, the Hebrews already knew about that. And, and modern science only discovered that about 200 years ago. Anyway, uh, they were mixed the blood, representing that the lives of the covenant the parties are all mixing, they're intertwined, they're no longer separated. Now, there's something here I want to share uh, that when we do communion, uh, next time when you do communion, do not stop at evaluating your relationship with God alone because in the covenant, everybody is part of that. So I, I find that in churches, we emphasize only our personal relationship with God during Holy Communion. But in fact, we should do that, but we must also add our relationship with everybody in the church. And this is the thing that I hate about people hopping from church to church, because when you're in a church, you are in the covenanting relationship with everybody in that community. So do not switch so easily. All right. Now, Related to that is this idea of a covenant, right? You see the cup, the blood evolving, and now here you have the word for covenant. And it is the same word from the blood. And now they added the sun and the moon. And the sun and the moon mean, mean means to declare. So this is part of the reason why we have regular Holy Communion, to declare our relationship with God and with one another. And Jesus talks about that. He said, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Sorry, this is what Paul said. So a covenantal relationship is not a private relationship. It has to be public. Our faith is personal, but should never be private. Our faith is personal, it should be act out, proclaim in the public square. Now, this is a great temptation of our days. Uh, governments love that. They say you can believe as long as you don't bring it to the public square. But that is not covenantal relationship. A covenantal relationship is public. We wear a ring. Sorry, I woke up, <coughs> forgot to put on my ring uh, when we are married. You know, why do we do that? You know, we wear the ring to proclaim that we are in a covenantal relationship with our spouse. So in the same way, uh, the ancient Chinese understood that a covenant has to be proclaimed. And that sacrifice has to be special. This is the Chinese word for special, te, te, be it a te. Originally, this word means the animal itself. All right, in the book of uh, Li Ji, which is corresponding to the book of Leviticus, it explained, it has a whole book to explain about the sacrifice. And the, the animal that were used is referred to as ter. This is a cow rest, radical, and this is the Chinese word for a century. So anyway, you can see that ter, it's related to the sacrifice. And it has to be special. Uh, down to the point of the size of the horn and the color has to be perfect, no blemish. And the result is that of righteousness. Now, this is the Chinese word for yi. As in our English-speaking world, sometimes when people talk about that is a righteous person, we think of that as a personal quality. It may be so, but actually before that, righteousness is a condition. It's being right with God. It is a legal position. It is not an inert personal quality. Of course, out of that right relationship with God, we go on in our sanctification 
become a righteous person. But the first and foremost thing is that it is being right with God. You know, we see here that in the, the Chinese, this is the oracle bone form. You can see the lamb with a dagger piercing it. So righteousness has to do with sacrifice. And this is a fan uh, zi, right? This is a classical form. You see the lamb with the tail cut off and then me, wo, at the bottom. So righteousness is when I accept the lamb of God and God sees me now through the lamb. And this is the variant form and now it is being used uh, in the simplified, but it was not invented by Chairman Mao in the 60s when he simplified Chinese characters. This was a, another form and it was an ancient form. And this is a shellish, it's the same, the qi min, you know, the cup. And now there's a blood. So once again, you know, righteousness has to do with a covenantal relationship. And to further illustrate that righteousness and sacrifice are related. This one should be uh, sacrifice. This is season the sea, all right? Season sacrifice has two parts. You have the, the cow radical on the left and then righteousness on the right. So it clearly tells you that ancient Chinese understood that righteousness has to do with that sacrifice. Now, this is a, a variant form. Again, you know, the iconic system has variant forms. This one, instead of the, this is the spear, all right? A man is a very fierce one. He carries a, uh, well, this is his hand and he carries a spear on the right. But here they change it to xiu. Xiu, it's mean, it means perfect, all right? Xiu li, perfect, beautiful. So in other words, they understood that the sacrifice that is acceptable has to be perfect. The result is that uh, when we accept Christ, like in the case of Noah, accept God and he saved his family. So when an ancient Chinese thought of a word to describe that big boat, they thought of the ark, all right? On the left side is the word for ark. So, and then Pako, eight mouths. Now, coincidence? I don't think so because that ark that saved Noah and his family, exactly eight of them. Noah, his wife, and his three sons, and their wives. So all together, eight of them. So this is, um, <clears throat> again, the ancient Chinese knowledge of the creation. Now, I not only have the words. Now, sometimes people say, oh, you know, it's like looking at clouds. You can tell, you can say what it means. You know, you can oh, that looks like a cow, that looks like a sheep. Uh, but I do have another source of evidence to support what I say. It was discovered in the 80s, a major civilization in the Sichuan province. That place is called San Sintui. You can Google it. Um, there were many artifacts. They, they, they discovered that they estimated that uh, about three to 4,000, almost 5,000 years ago, there was a civilization there. And this is a major discovery. It changed a lot of experts' opinion on, on the development of China. Uh, now, you all might know that the theory in the past is that the Chinese people started in the Yellow River Delta in the north. But now they find this major civilization that had up to 2 million people, and they found many artifacts. But there's one distinct, the largest piece of artifact that puzzles them. It is this piece of a bronze tree it is 3.95 meters tall, all right? It's like a life-size tree, huge. And the quality of the bronze and all that, now they, they know through uh, the dating method that this tree is at least 27 to 4,700 years old. This means that this bronze object was made before the Bible was written down. And on that tree, there are knives protecting fruits. You see the fruit there? And then there are knives that protect them. And there are beautiful birds on the tree. And interestingly, I do not know whether you can make it out. First of all, look at the left side. You will see here a snake winding down the tree, all right? This looks like a snake. 
And this is a closer picture on the right. You can see his eye. And interestingly, you see he has leg. He has a, a leg here. All right, this is a snake that walks. And you see a hand reaching out to the tree. Now, take a closer look, uh, especially the one on the right side of the picture. Tell me, is this a lady or a man's hand? I personally think that it's very clearly it's a woman's hand, right? It's long and tender, you know, great for playing the piano. I think it's a woman's hand. And then you have knife, as if to say what? Don't do it, right? The knife means don't do it. So you tell me, what does this tree mean? Now, you know, Chinese experts still call this the Sun Sin Tui Bronze Tree Puzzle. They say, what does this mean? Why did our ancient uh, forefathers make this huge object. Again, I would suggest to you that the simplest answer is the best answer. The simplest explanation for this tree is that this is a depiction of the fall in the Garden of Eden. And as I, uh, I think I shared before that the Chinese and the Hebrews had no interactions uh, at that time. So I think that knowledge came when the, the first Chinese migrants that came after the Tower of Babel brought with them the memory of God and the creation story. And they wanted their children to, to remember that this is the major turning point in history and probably never to do it again. Uh, they, made, they made this tree, uh, bronze tree. I love this quote. It's uh, a linguist, uh, Calgren. He said, lit language, literary language, is the greatest artistic creation of a civilized nation. It is not shaped by philologists at their desk, but by the giants of thought who have something to say to their contemporaries and who carve the monuments from the solid granite of the spoken language. So, this is a beautiful thing. I love the Chinese language. I'm English educated, but I love the Chinese language because of this, that, that you know, when you study them, you can actually get into the minds of the ancient because what they knew, what they think about are inscribed in those characters that they design. And it is like opening a window. It's like on our cell phone, when we touch an icon, a window is open. So when you touch on these icons, windows are open to us into our ancient past. Now, with that, I want to pause. Maybe you all have a couple of questions and then uh, I will take a break and then we will come back. Any question about this first part? <clears throat> Any discussion? So I want to move on to another area I call Magi from the West. Uh, interestingly, you talk about prophecy. The ancient Chinese had a prophecy that the holy man is from the West. Xifang Yu Shen Ren, and that is in the Tao Te Ching. So uh, for a long time, there's a fascination of going West. You all know the story of Xi Yu Ji, right? The uh, Su Wukong, you know, the Monkey King. Uh, that was, of course, a mythological story that is based on a historical fact. This Tan Sheng, this uh, monk from the Tang Dynasty wanted to go to the West to Qi Jin to, to find the scripture. But interestingly, he ended up in India. We all know that India is not the West, it's the South. So he went the wrong way. All right. Um, <clears throat> but there had been wise men from the West to China and they made a huge impact in 1999, at the end of the year, the Chinese rushed and they completed this massive uh, monumental project in Beijing. And it is to usher in the 21st century. This was a packed project of Jiang Zemin. Uh, if you go to Beijing and you can visit this place, it's called the Millennium Monument. And in it, the showpiece is uh, called Zhonghua Qian Qiu Song a tribute to Chinese history. It is depicted on this war relief, um, 5,000 years of Chinese civilization 
all the major events and people like you can see here on the right is Sun Zhong Shan and uh, Confucius, the printing press, that this guy is Kangxi. But interestingly, on this wall, there is actually one Westerner, and I will get you the close up. It's this guy with a telescope and a globe. This man was Matthew Ritchie. Who was he? He was very honored, along with all the other Jesuit missionaries to China. Now, I want to say something about the Jesuits. Not everyone who disagreed with the corruption in the Catholic Church left. So there was an internal reformation. And that internal reformation was started by a guy called Ignatius of Loyola. And if you read his book, The Spiritual Discipline, you will actually find that he is very evangelical. I think he's even more evangelical than today's evangelical. Um, so that's why he named his new society the Jesuits, which is a return to the focus on Jesus. Now, of course, we all know, if you, if you follow that history, it got corrupted also later when he went to Latin America and he got involved in politics and all that. So that's why sometimes when I mention Jesuits, there are people who objected. I said, well, you know, just like the word Christians, um, there are good Christians, especially at the beginning, and then they, we got corrupted. So they are very bad Christians. You cannot just say that all Christians are bad just because of some bad aches. So in the same way, the Jesuits actually started out very well and as a result of that internal reformation, a strong missionary zeal happened and they sent Jesuit missionaries all over the world. And they, some of them ended up in China. This is a cemetery dedicated to them, which is just right outside the second ring road in Beijing. If you have been to Beijing, um, the second ring road actually was the imperial wall of uh, Beijing city in, in the past, but they tore it down and some Chinese lament that they say they wish to have that. But anyway, uh, for quote unquote progress, Chairman Mao tore it down and built the second ring road, but within two kilometers to the east of uh, Guan Yuan Qiao, there is this uh, party school that actually was a seminary owned by the Jesuits because the the emperor gave them this piece of land and they buried um, the missionaries. And if you look at the headstones, you can tell that these men were greatly honored by the emperor. All these were com uh, commissioned by the emperor. And this, nobody gets buried you know, within the city, by the way. So it, this tells you that these guys were special. And the three main ones, you can see here, the largest one is that to commemorate Matthew Ritchie. And then um, to the left is uh, Shaw, and then to the right is Wabiz. I want to mention them afterwards. Now, all these headstones were buried underground during the Cultural Revolution. Some guys, the people there had the presence of mind, they know that the Red Guards would destroy them. So all those headstones you, you can see, and some were destroyed, but there were 30 something left still. Um, they were buried and then they were uh, brought up again after the Cultural Revolution. And you, you can see how honored they were, you know, giving them the dragon symbol, even though I, I <laughs> if I have a chance to tell you about the dragon, uh, I do not like it. But anyway, uh, it is an imperial symbol by the time of the Qing Dynasty and all their accomplishments, their contribution to China are written here. Now, these are all headstones of foreign missionaries to China. The first one, the most prominent one is a man called Matthew Ritchie, Chinese name Li Ma Dou. Um, he was not the first missionary to China, but he became the most prominent. And he went there during the late Ming Dynasty, during the reign of the last emperor of the Ming Dynasty, no, I shouldn't say the, the last, not, not quite the last, but uh, close to the last, Wan Li. Uh, he went there and first he adopted, you know, the monk uh, approach, the, the Buddhist approach. And then he realized that the, the, the Buddhists were really, you know, that uh, not 
well accepted and he doesn't believe in, in being identified with them. Then later he went on and he identified himself as a Confucius scholar. There are many stories about him, but he was a brilliant man. Uh, his memory was so fantastic. The Jesuits had a way of memorizing, uh, just to explain to you. Now, if I ask you, where is your passport? You can probably tell me. You can just, you know, even if you're away from home, you're at your office, you want to send somebody to your home to collect your passport. You say, you know, get into my house, you know, uh, you walk past the living room and then to the right, it's my bedroom. You go into my bedroom and you see a desk on the right on the second drawer in the middle section. You would open it, you see my passport, okay? So the Jesuits built on that idea, they have what they call a memory palace. They will, they, uh, now in those days, you, re you remember they don't have iPhone, they don't have ways of recording. So they built uh, palaces in their mind and then they shelf their information in those palaces, in, in those compartments. And they, they were such great memorizer. So Matthew Ritchie, Fascinated the Chinese at, at a uh, event in Nanjing. He was uh, invited by a government leader and they heard of his memory skill. They asked him to demonstrate and they brought out a, a book and they asked him to read and he turned it down and he recited it word for word. And the host was impressed, but he said, you know, you probably read the book before. He said, no, I never read this book before. It's the first time. The host said, no, I don't believe you. So he said, okay, all right. Get, get a piece of paper out. And he had like a thousand guests. And everyone, he said, everyone write a word, just random, random word. So they wrote and he looked at it and he turned it down and he recited it word for word. And that was how impressive he was. Now, there are people who can actually do that even nowadays uh, with great memory skill. But more important than that, he was a mathematician and he was an evangelist. And he, he uh, decided to go to Beijing. And after a while, he got to know some very prominent people. And the Emperor Wan Li was actually very interested to meet with him. But by the time the Ming dynasty was very corrupt, uh, it was known that one emperor had never held court in 12 years. He was, Wang Li himself was very fat, so he, he wouldn't see people. And he, so Richie never get a chance to meet him, but they had communications indirectly and they gave him a clock and a map of the world. And the People's Daily credits Richie for the introduction of the world map, Western mathematics and astronomy to China. While there, Richie recognized that uh, the calendar was a very important part of China. You know, uh, if in the old days, I do not know why your parents used the book, you know, the red alamac uh, in Chinese is called Tongshen because they did not want to call it Tongsu. It's, it's a book on all the information that you need and it particularly about when, which are the auspicious day. Now remember they are an agrarian society, so they needed to do their planting, right? They need to know uh, what to do, what. So a lot of it depended on the calendar and the accuracy of it. So Richie realized that the Chinese calendar was not good enough. So he appealed to Rome and asked for qualified astronomer to come to join him. And that person was Johann Adam Shaw, Tang Ruo Wang. He came in the final years of the Ming Dynasty. Ming Dynasty fell. Oh, by the way, he, he was uh, recruited and he started to work in the astronomical department of the Ming Dynasty. But the Ming Dynasty fell and he decided to stay on. And the new emperor, the Qing Emperor Sun Tzu, liked him so much, recruited him, and he became the director of that astronomical uh, society that determines the calendar. But there were people who were jealous of him, so there were a lot of uh, competitions. And in the end, he was scandalized, um, even though he was actually 
doing his job very well. He was thrown in prison. Um, but before he died, he was able to make a very significant contribution to China. Um, now, Sun Tzu actually liked him so much. And one of the reasons why they, they were jealous of him was Sun Tzu started to call him father, right? You know, you call a, a Catholic priest father. And the rest of the Qing emperor will say, you know, this is, this is against our culture. How, how can the emperor call another person father? You know, this is, uh, this is totally out of uh, whack. So they were very jealous of him. But Sun Tzu actually loved him a, a lot. Uh, except that Sun Tzu fell in love with a concubine who was a very uh, devout uh, Buddhist. So refused baptism, but they had lots of conversations. But before Sun Tzu died of uh, smallpox at a very young age, 20 something, he asked Shaw for his opinion who his successor would be. And Shaw told him to select the next emperor, Kangxi. And Kangxi rose to become the most, uh, well, probably one of the best emperors of all of China. He reigned for 61 years. Uh, you have a chance I will talk about his story. Uh, just, uh, he started, Kangxi started a development in China that had a huge impact. But anyway, this is, um, a cosmological map that Shaw produced for China. And you will see here that this cathedral in Beijing, it's still there, was built uh, to honor him. And his sidekick, now Kang, uh, Shaw died and his sidekick, Wabis, <clears throat> uh, took over and Wabis became the personal tutor of Kangxi. Kangxi became the emperor, like I said, his father died young, so he was only nine years old. So he he had a region until he was about 14 years old, and then he uh, finally ruled. But all along the way, Kangxi was tutored by Wabis. And so Wabis later rose up. Actually, his rank was like the prime minister of China. Have you ever heard of that? You do not know that, right? But there was once a prime minister of China that was a foreigner. And when he died, Kangxi honored him with a funeral fit for the queen. Um, they, they held lots of conversations and had a very good relationship. And my, again, my theory that uh, Kangxi, <clears throat> Kangxi himself wrote in his final memorial before he died, he said, you know, all the emperors before me, when they, they ruled for a long time, uh, they never end up well. He, he said, you know, that is part of human nature. But he turned out to be the longest serving emperor of China since Qin Shi Huang. He ruled for 61 years. Now his grandson, Qianlong, ruled for 60 years. Qianlong, <clears throat> to honor him, honor Kangxi, actually abdicated the throne. Uh, again, a very rare feat in China, but uh, Again, the, the Jesu influence was there. So Kangxi um, was a little emperor, and yet he remained, I would say, a righteous king, uh, accomplished great things, both militarily and in terms of government. You know, uh, it's like the, the King James Bible of China is the Kangxi Da Zidian, you know, the great uh, dictionary of China. Uh, produced by Kangxi, all of that. And he had written poems that indicated he had a clear, indica uh, clear understanding of salvation. If you go to China, uh, you go to Beijing, you'll probably see this in uh, Jian Guomen. These are astronomical uh, equipments that were commissioned and built by Webist. Another, uh, this is, a, I think the name is St. Stephen's Church, built by Kangxi in honor of a beast. Now, 
when I went to that cemetery, I had been there many times. I know the curator there. Uh, I think he's no longer there. He retired. I was in conversation with him. I asked him, I said, you know, uh, there, there are suggestions that the Jesuits come to take advantage of China and the spies. And that guy just shook. He said, he said, no, it cannot be. Uh, he is uh, China's foremost experts on the Jesuits. He even went to their hometowns to visit them. He says, no, it cannot be. He said, these guys left the country, never returned home. Uh, in fact, when Richie uh, wrote home to Maserata in Italy, his family complained that Richie's Italian had gone, you know, crooked because he had never returned home. He said, these guys uh, gave their lives to China. He said there is no indication they were spies for the foreign countries and they make great contributions. And I asked this professor, I said, what do you think was their, their greatest contribution to China? And he said, well, you know, the clock, math and all that. But I said, what about their faith? And his face turned a little bit red. I, I said, you know, you ask Richie and Shaw and Wabiz, what are the most important things in life? What would they say? And he had to agree with me. He says, yeah, of course, you know, it is your faith that brought them to China. So here you can see that they were determined to bring the gospel to China. Now, I share with, about them. I, I want to lay the foundation because these are experts, all right? They are experts, professionals in precise science, mathematics, map making, uh, calendar, and this is Richie's conclusion, and he wrote it in the book called Tian Zu Shi, The True Meaning of the Lord of Heaven. It's written in Wen Yan Wen, all right? Uh, my Chinese friends, when they saw that, they, they were humbled. They said, wow, this guy is Chinese. It's much better than us. Of course, because he lived at the time, he worked in the court. Uh, that was language they still use. So he was, here this is the conclusion. He who is called the Lord of Heaven in my humble country, uh, Lord of Heaven is Tianzu, right? The Catholic Tianzu Jiao, Lord of Heaven, is he who is called Shang Di <clears throat> in Chinese. This is the original Chinese. And then, therefore, having lived through a great number of ancient books. Now, when Richie said, having lived through a great number of ancient books, he was a master learner and he worked in the court. He had access to the Hanlin Academy which is like the Chinese, uh, Chinese equivalent of the Library of Congress. Unfortunately, that was burned by the boxes in the 1900, all right? Um, so a lot of those books are no longer available to us. So Matthew Ritchie had sources that we do not have anymore. And moreover, he understood the ancient Chinese language much better than even today's best Chinese academics. So it is quite clear to me that the sovereign on high, okay, sovereign on high is Shangdi, and the Lord of heaven are different only in name. So here you have it. This is an expert's opinion. <clears throat> and they influence a lot of people. Uh, like I said, Kangxi, now Kangxi refused baptism because one of the requirements that the Jesuits had for them was that they can only have one wife. Uh, there was a very famous minister, a uh, uh, compatriot of uh, Paul Shi Guan Qi. Now you go to Shanghai today, there is a museum there to honor this fellow. Uh, he was considered one of the most influential Ming minister. All right, he is like the prime minister during the Ming dynasty. But one of his uh, compatriot, uh, Li Zizhao, was refused baptism until he renounced his uh, concubines. So that's how serious the Jesuits were. And so Kangxi never did uh, receive baptism, even though he was very close. And the last week, I, I mean, the last time I shared about the border sacrifice, that a controversy arose because the Jesuits actually participated. Remember, uh, Verbis became the prime minister. So of course he would but, uh, participate in the border sacrifice. So complaints were made against the Jesuits by the Dominicans and the Franciscans. Now, 
Part of it is misunderstanding because the Dominicans and Franciscans work with the grassroots, whereas the Jesuits work with the top, the elite of society. So what the Dominicans and the Franciscans saw were Chinese idolatry. So when they, when they found out that the Jesuits were involved in this Chinese sacrifice, they wrote and they complained uh, to the Pope. <clears throat> and then there's also another aspect of it, it is that of jealousy, right? The Jesuits were living, you know, with the highest honor. They were, you know, prime minister. So imagine the treatment they received and the Franciscans and the Dominicans live very poorly. The, the Franciscans especially, and now the, the present Pope is a Franciscan monk, uh, famous for, you know, um, working with uh, the, the, the grassroots of society. So there was some jealousy there. And the result of that was what is called the rights controversy, something if you're interested in, you can read. And uh, Rome and China got into a huge argument. The last time I mentioned to you, Kangxi responded and, and explained that no, he was not worshiping his ancestors. He brought them along to worship and all of that. Um, so the end of that was uh, Kangxi felt really uh, offended uh, that the envoy sent by Rome was not understanding. So he decided, well, I don't want to do anything with you guys. So he kept, he kept the Jesuits that were useful to him and he expelled all the missionaries, including the Franciscans and the Dominicans. Now, in a sense, uh, that saved China from turning into a Catholic country. Otherwise, it was on track to become one. <clears throat> All right, uh, so we have the Catholics' uh, conclusion, but what about the Protestant, right? So in the 19th century, there arose a man called James Lake. Now, he, he, you heard about uh, evangelical missions to China. You probably heard about Robert Morrison. Now, this is a successor to Robert Morrison. Uh, James Lake was considered the foremost Chinese expert in the 19th century. And that honor is even accepted by Chinese experts themselves, like uh, this guy called Wang Tao himself was uh, China's foremost uh, sinologist, and he honored James Lake. James Lake, when he left China, he returned to Oxford. He became the first professor of Chinese. He spent 25 years <clears throat> to study and translate the Chinese classics. At his memorial, this is said of him, <clears throat> for if ever, ever men love a people, James Lake loved the Chinese, and he could not bear to see them do wrong or suffer it. The longest and the most embittered controversy in which he was ever engaged was one with certain missionaries who did not think of the root ideas of the old Chinese religion as he did. Nominally, it related to the question whether they had any word that could be used to translate the idea of God, really and substantially. It concerned whether they had any idea of God at all, and he maintained they had, or, he, or did he not judge with charity as well as knowledge? So this was the principal of Mansfield College and his eulogy at James Lake's memorial service. <clears throat> the controversy was this when this is a time when the Chinese Bible was being translated and James Lake and most of the British missionaries preferred the term Shangti. Remember last week we talked about that. This is an indigenous Chinese term, but the other missionaries, particularly those from America whose scholarship was not as good as the British, insisted that they shouldn't because they feel that Shangti is like calling God Su Wukong, you know, because it was an indigenous Chinese term. So they prefer the word Shen. So today, if you buy a Chinese Bible, you can choose the Her Herban, you know, the standard version. Uh, you, you can choose a Shangti version or a Shen version because the, the division was actually quite uh, strong. So if you read the Chinese uh, Shen Bible, you will see there is an empty space before it. Now, many people today uh, mistakenly think that that is a way to honor God. You know, you, you leave a space uh, before Shen uh, to honor God, but it's actually not that. It's because the printer 
uh, <clears throat> needed to print two versions because there are people who prefer to use Shanti Banpen, uh, the Shanti version or the Shen version. So to, to minimize their cost, <clears throat> they use only one typeset and they only remove um, you know, the empty space and put Shanti, you know, two, because Shanti has two words, Shen has only one. So anyway, uh, the, the debate was actually quite fierce and it caused a lot of consternation. Now, nowadays it's no longer with us and people mistakenly think that Shanti is uh, uh, a foreign term that was imposed on China, but really it was an indigenous Chinese term. Now, 30 years after Lake's death, a Congress of Oriental Languages was held in Oxford in 1928, and during the conference, a representation of professors from countries such as France, Italy, Holland, Germany, and so forth. This is what <clears throat> they honor James with to the immortal genius of the great master James Slate from the Sinologies assembled at the 17th Congress of Orientalists. I share this to set the stage for you to know that James Slate was highly respected and he was respected by his colleagues. And what was his conclusion? This is James Lake's conclusion. He actually wrote a whole thesis on it, and some of which I use in my book. I maintain that the Chinese do not know the true, uh, do know the true God and have a word in their language answering to our word God, to the Hebrew Elohim and to the Greek Theos. So here you have it, all right? These are experts people who spend their lives studying China and Chinese languages and classics, and they come to that conclusion. And then finally, I want to share something very exciting with you. Um, the heavens declare the glory of God. Just as in the Bible, the Chinese believe that God uses the heavenly bodies to send messages to men. Now, this is not astrology. Uh, in the astrology believes that the stars and the moons and the movement control our lives. So this is not a matter of control, but this is a matter of communication. Because even in the Bible, uh, we know that like in Psalm 19, you know, the heavens declare the glory of God, you know, day by day it, uh, sends out his speech. So the God who flung the stars into space would also use them to communicate messages to us. And usually, now this is another difference between astrology and what I'm talking about here. Astrology is about my personal well-being or, or personal fortune, whereas these extra phenomena are for the people, all right? It major event. It's not a personal thing. So the Chinese were astute uh, student of the, the skies. Uh, every dynasty would have a team. And uh, during the Ming Dynasty, they had 14 officials, 14 observing every night the movements of the stars and all. And they write them down and it's all recorded in Chinese history and they interpreted them. Uh, you will find some interpretation to be quite amazing. So this was one event that they recorded and interpreted in the second month of the second year, the comment was out of Altair for more than 70 days. It is said comets appear to signify the old being replaced by the new. Altair, the sun, the moon, and the five stars are in movement to signify the beginning of a new epoch, the beginning of a new year, a new month, and a new day. The appearance of this comet undoubtedly symbolizes change. The extended appearance of this comet indicates that this is of great importance. This is the year of Tianping, all right? This is another um, reference to the same event. And this is the interpretation, all right? It talks about perfect sacrifice. So it talks about a new beginning and a sacrifice. Now, this uh, observation correspond with the star in the East in the Bible. And we all know that it signifies the coming of Jesus. Of course, that will be a new epoch. You know, it's a new uh, season. And also that he came to sacrifice himself. Now, interestingly, now that the star uh, early on appeared for 70 days. But then 13 months later, uh, another phenomenon was recorded. It was recorded on the Jiayu day of the third month for the third year of Jianping, 
that appeared to be a bold star in Aquila. Now, this corresponds to the star at Bethlehem. Now, you read the Bible, actually, there were two stars, right? We know that the, the wise men first saw the star and they came. But after they arrived in Jerusalem, they couldn't see the star. Otherwise, they, they wouldn't need to ask uh, uh, and went to see King Herod. So the Chinese say that it appeared for 70 days and it disappeared. But then 13 months later, another star appeared. And this is the star of Bethlehem. And, and I think this is the reason why King Herod talked to the wise men and discovered that uh, it was more than a year ago that they first saw it. So he decided to kill the children two years and under. So there is a reason for that. And then finally, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going quickly here. Uh, 30 over years later, uh, the, the Bible recorded on the day of the cross, it was about the sixth hour, the darkness fell. Six hours is about noon over the whole land until the ninth hour because the sun was obscured and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Did the Chinese see it and record it? Yes, of course, the Chinese did. In the day of Guihai, the last day of the month, this was 33 years later than the, uh, the phenomena that was recorded earlier, the sun was eclipsed or shrouded. The emperor avoided entering the throne room without all military activities and did not handle official business for five days. And he made an official announcement proclaiming that my poor character has caused this calamity, that the sun and the moon will veil. I'm fearful and trembling. What else can I say? Anyone who presents a memorial is not allowed to mention the word holy. This is the original Chinese. And then <clears throat> um, there were other commentaries and response to this event. On the fourth month, on the day of Renwu, the imperial edict reads, Yin and Yang have mistakenly switched, returned it, you know, referring to that uh, event. And the sun and the moon were eclipsed. Now here, eclipse means covered up. The sins of the, all the people are now on one man. The emperor proclaims pardon to all under heaven. Now, wouldn't this be a perfect commentary on the day of the cross? Wouldn't this be what happened in Jerusalem? that the sins of the world are now on one man, on Jesus. Now, even more interestingly, um, another commentator, Qian Tan Ba, said, eclipse on the day of Kui Hai means that the man from heaven dies. Very interestingly, um, if you understand Chinese, this word for death, pen, it's only a reference to the king or the emperor. All right, people die, si, but the emperor dies, it's peng. So <clears throat> uh, isn't Jesus the Tianren, you know, the man from heaven? You know, Tianren meaning heavenly man. Uh, that actually means as well as God and man. He is the true God man. And that the Chinese understood that that uh, shrouding of the sun and the moon reference that uh, the heavenly man dies. And, and that heavenly man was a king because the word they use for death refers to the king. So this, this is amazing. And if you ask me, how do they know? I do not know how, but you know, they practice this for uh, a few thousand years. Um, we, the, the knowledge is lost to us, but they receive the prophetic word and they, they understand the prophecy and they were able to uh, decipher them and interpret them for us. So anyway, 